Hello. Hey, Richard. Dave Lawrence, HPR. Hey, Dave. How you doing? What's going on, brother? Good. Good. Everything's good. How are you? I am good, too. Thank you. Looks like just a pair of dates for you, right? The 4th in Honolulu of October and then the 6th in Kahului. Yeah, correct, yeah. Okay, just double checking. Well, first and foremost, welcome back and thank you for doing this. Well, my, my pleasure. Absolutely, my pleasure. I haven't talked to you in a few years. And first, I guess also congrats on the work on the Cold Blue World War II documentary from HBO. People are poking around at Richard's website or online. You can see some news or maybe you've already seen this. Explain what you did and, and how you got involved with this project. Well, I got involved because uh, the producer is an old friend of mine, uh, and I've done a few scores uh, for him before. So um, he found uh, in the uh, National Archive uh, 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 color footage from World War II um, of, of uh, B-17s um, in, in combat, uh, shot by William Wyler, the, the great Hollywood director. And... Um, they uh, restored the footage, and it looks absolutely amazing. And uh, it, it's it's quite uh, it's, it's quite moving. Um, it's um, the, the, you know the, the, it's 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 uh, it's the crews and it's the ground crews and uh, all stationed in the UK, uh, 1943, and uh, and uh, doing raids over Germany um, and. Uh, you know, it's um, it's 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 very intense and very emotional, and uh, the um, uh, the whole piece is narrated by survivors from, from the Eighth Air Force, so that they found nine guys, um, all in their nineties, who 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 were crew uh, in that campaign, and um, and and the, their stories alone are pretty extraordinary. It's all American forces, and, and they're flying B-17s. Nice. Well, and the process <laughs> of doing this sort of thing, as you've alluded to, you've done this before. Interesting, you knew, you knew the cat, so it was a good connection there. For folks who yeah. have never film, scored a film, describe how that kind of process works, if you can, in, in a linear way. Do they, they hand you a bunch of stuff? Do you go look at things? What, how does it work? Uh... Well, you know, first of all, you, you leave your ego at the door. Um, you, you're a slave to, to to the picture, whatever the picture requires. Uh, that, that's what you have to do. Um, and um, you know, in one sense, you know, the, the best film scoring is is the stuff that you're not you're hardly aware of. It, it just kind of uh, enhances the emotion of, of of the picture, whatever it's doing. Uh, for this film, I, I used to like a chamber orchestra. Um, I, I used some, some strings and, and some uh, French horns, oboe, clarinet, percussion, um, and uh, that seemed to, to kind of um, hit the right emotional notes anyway uh, for, for this piece. Um, but, but you know, every 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 film score is different, and every uh, film brings uh, different. <clears throat> different uh, needs and um, everything that needs to be addressed in a fresh way. Do you get to, do you first sit down and watch some of the stuff and with a notepad and say, all right, this is what I hear. I'm going to need an orchestra for this, or this is going to be more. I mean, when you say it's going to be different, I get yeah. that. But, but what is that first process? Is it you with no sound, just sitting there watching the, 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 the video? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, it, it, it was shot without sound, first of all, um, uh, because uh, the, the, the you know, you know, sound capture just wasn't available in that, in that way at the time. So, so um, uh, everything had to be added. So, so um, you know, you know, the B seventeens, you know, revving up, uh, cruising at altitude, uh, all that was was added um, afterwards, and, and obviously the, the music was added as well. So, this, so the process really starts. With uh, just looking at the uh, at, at the at the film and uh, and actually say taking notes, saying it needs something here, needs something here, uh, because there was a lot of narration and a lot of just planes cruising in, in this film. Um, it needed almost wall to wall music, so, so I composed basically seventy minutes of music for a seventy minute film, and then we judiciously removed things. It was a kind of a reverse process. And then they and, stick the uh, narration yeah. in, where, and they remove your stuff and stick in the narration. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or, or it plays under the narration. Um, okay. And uh, in some cases, yeah, you, you know, a, a plane cruising in altitude uh, uh, is hitting a note. You know, four engines hit this note, which is sometimes 
uh, yeah, it hits a pitch, it hits the note of A or D or something, and sometimes it's between notes. So um, sometimes the, the, the planes had to be digitally tuned wow. uh, into a real key <laughs> uh, to um, to make sense of the music as well. And, and, and um, you know, I, I, often what I wrote was dictated by the, by the drone of the planes. That's fascinating. That's really neat. Like one of those things that uh, all the rap and hip hop music uses that little tonal thing they use on the voice. Is that what you sort of use on the on the plane? Yeah. Um, well, a harmonizer, exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you you, you 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 can digitally cheat things up and down, or you know, in a way that you, you really wouldn't notice. That's fun. Well, that's an interesting. Uh, and is the narration already in place when you're get doing your thing, or is that still yet to come? Uh, the, the narration was, was mostly there. I mean, in a few places it wasn't, but it was mostly there. Uh, and the plain noise, you, you know, uh, in some cases was there, in some cases it wasn't. So uh, that was another, you know, ongoing process to get that fixed. Um, and did you have to go get the? Done. Did you go and get the plane sounds yourself, Richard, and get them from the actual? Do they still <laughs> do they still have those aircraft uh, available to get the yeah, sound? Yeah, um, I, I didn't do it, but. But um, a sound engineer, uh, or well, how many? How many, how many did they take? I, I think it was like three sound engineers uh, took a flight on uh, on an existing um, surviving B seventeen and flew it, uh, you, you know, around Florida, and um, but they got all the noises uh, that, that they, they got, you know, the, um, engines starting up, uh, you know, um, a taking off, landing, cruising, the, the whole thing. Um, uh, the, the sounds of the, of the machine guns on the plane, you know, were, were meticulously recorded. And, um, you know, the, 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 all the stereo is, is, is perfect in the film. You know, le left, right, center, it's all, it all matches um, absolutely perfectly. It, it's a very loving restoration. Wow, cool for you, man. That's interesting to hear how yeah. something like that is done, and certainly, uh, yeah, your work on that quite a bit different than Thirteen Rivers. Your 18th solo record came <laughs> out just before that, uh, and the details note that project was recorded almost entirely in what seems like a short span of time. But you've been doing this for decades, so I don't know. It was under two weeks and using all analog gear. Talk a little bit about that. Well, uh, you can record quickly if you have uh, the right musicians to do it. And, and um, you know, I've been working with these guys in my band for, you know, 15, 20 years. Uh, so uh, they're really good at what they do. Uh, and that enables us to, to, to go in fairly quickly uh, and capture something while it's still got some, some spirit and some emotion, you know, uh, to, so before you get tired of, of something, right, right. Uh, you, you just put it down quickly. Uh, you know, it's recorded, uh, you know, 24-track uh, analog. And, um, you yeah, know, at some point, you, you dump it into the digital realm. Um, but it's nice to have that warmth of analog. Yeah, I think it really sounds different. It sounds a bit more real for me. Was it recorded in L.A.? And where are you living these days? I live in uh, New Jersey these days, but that was recorded um, at Boulevard Studios in Los Angeles, uh, which is uh, a great old studio. Um, it's been there for uh, 60, 70 years. Wow, in New Jersey. Where in Jersey, approximately? Uh, I'm in Montclair. Wow. <laughs> what would uh, I grew up in Wilmington, Delaware. What what uh, drove you to be in 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 New Jersey? Uh, probably a woman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good excuse. That or the that or the beach or the saltwater taffy at the boardwalk would do it. Uh, oh, yeah, that's a good one, too. Mm. And you have an unusual concert coming up soon. And when we air this, actually, uh, the show's going to already have happened, probably. And that is your, mm -hmm. your 70th birthday celebration, September 30th, Royal Albert Hall. Now, your birthday, uh, from what I read, is in April, uh, April 3rd. So, happy belated birthday. So, what, was it a matter oh, of, of scheduling, or why is the concert happening in late September? Uh, I think it's because it's very hard to get dates at the Albert Hall. You know, it gets booked um, mostly for classical music, and uh, you know they're just finishing up a whole month of, of the promenade concerts, which happen every year. So, uh, really, I mean, it's it's pretty inconvenient, but because um, you know we play the Albert Hall, and the next show is is uh, is Hawaii. So, so um, <laughs> and and we've got you know two days to get there. So it's uh, it's pretty tight schedule.
Well, luckily, you're not bringing that whole cavalcade of guests. He's got just about everybody, it seems like, from his life and then yeah. some plugged in for this thing. Uh, lots of guests. I'm saying maybe 20 or more. I, I, it's hard to keep track of from what I saw. Is it you, Richard, who puts the list together and invites all these folks? Describe how something like that is generated for this. Oh, boy. Uh, well, you know, um, I had a list of people that I, I wanted, um, you know, or, or I, you know, I hoped might be able to do it. And, um, I, you know, I probably got 30, 40 percent of, of, my, of, of my, my wish list. Um, my, um, my UK agent had another list uh, of people that they wanted. And, and so I kind of vetted that and, and then the, the, they, the, the, they kind of got hold of those people as well. So it's a sort of combination of, of a couple of lists, and uh, you know, I'm I'm, I'm thrilled that, that the people who are coming is absolutely absolutely fantastic. Um, and uh, the, the only issue now is, is uh, trying to trying to get through the whole program um, <laughs> right. in time. You know, we're, 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 we've got three hours to to, uh, to 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 get get through the whole thing, and it's going to be um, pretty pretty close, and, and uh, it, it's going to be very exciting even music. Well, good thing you only got 30 to 40% of who you wanted, because if that list had gotten any bigger, it would have been a two- or three-day thing, or everybody would be there oh, all night. You're telling me. Yeah, it could have been crazy, but it's, it's going to be crazy anyway. And who? Uh, and you said you have three hours to do it in. When you, uh, so what do you do? You rent out the Royal Albert Hall, and is it kind of like Madison Square Garden, where you got to be out of there by 11, or the union starts charging you 10000 a minute or something like that? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so you know, we, we have to be done by eleven, or or what we hit we hit all the time. You know, for the union. So so um, we have to be very respectful of that. Wow, how interesting how that works. Yeah, um, and yeah. you, don't, you don't get the chance to, when you're renting a place like that, it's, it, they don't come with options like, hey, buy the extended package and keep it till one a.m. for an additional. <laughs> Well, you can do that, but it'll cost you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you ooh, 1 a.m., ooh, but yeah, you're just throwing money away there. <laughs> I get you. I get you. So you're saying what you're trying to say is between 11 and 1, it'll cost a lot more than just doing the 8 to 11 portion of the evening. Oh, my goodness, yeah. Yeah, you just, you know, forget having a fee. It's all going to go to the union. So. Right, I can so, dig um, it. I can yeah. dig it. Now, these cats that you've got, when you say you only got 30 to 40 percent, and dialing in on who you did get, a few of them, and there are a lot of them, we, we we don't have enough time to go through the whole list, but a few made me curious about what your connection is to them or why you want them on the thing. And, and I know you recent you did a, you did some recording with Derek Smalls from Spinal Tap, but explain how far mm -hmm. back you go with him and how he's a connection in your life. Well, you know, you know I, I, I've worked quite a lot with with, with, uh, with um, uh, Harry Shearer's wife, uh, uh, Judith Allen, who's who's a fine singer and songwriter. Um, you know, she she's been. Working with me on on stage and and uh, in the studio, probably for the last twenty years, and and, and through her, I, I I know Harry Shearer, um, um, Derek Small's alter ego, <laughs> and uh, and uh, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're both really uh, really funny people. I mean, you know, I, I mean, just hilariously funny, and um, so I'm I'm sure that the Harry can make it. It's going to be great. Oh, and you put a little Stonehenge around him, it would be a great little bit right there on the stage. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I get it. Exactly. Would be nice. Bob Mould from Husker Du. Yeah. Um, I mean, again, yeah, yeah, you, you know, an old friend um, who, uh, I, I mean, I, I was always surprised that he took an interest in, in my music. Um, but, but, you know, he, he's, he's a very, I mean, yeah, but people think of him as being, uh, you know, kind of at the punk end of music, but, but he's, he's a very melodic um, songwriter. And, then, you know, he just, he's a great all round musician. And, uh, um, Again, I'm delighted he can do it. Maybe he'll play that Wishing Well jam. That was a, uh, wasn't that his, uh, he had a great, like, solo song, late 80s, I always remember. He's very melodic and talented. Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Cat. Well, 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 yeah, well, we'll see what, what the set list is. <laughs> David Gilmore from Floyd. Now, where did you first cross paths with him? Was that way back in the Fairport days, or what's the story there? Well, you know, originally um, we used to do shows with um, the, the Pink Floyd that started in '67. Uh, you know, in, in the Sid Barrett days, uh, and then when uh, when Gilmore came in, uh, you know, I knew him a bit back then. Um, uh, for many years, we were both uh, on EMI Records in the UK. So, so you know, I, I just see him around the record company, and I'd see him. Um, uh, you know, the sort of EMI Christmas party and things. <laughs> and uh, what we also, I, I did some recording at, at uh, Pink Floyd Studio uh, in the 70s, 
uh, possibly 80s as well. Um, so that was nice. Uh, you, you know, he's, he's just a good guy, and, and um, I've always liked him a lot, and uh, I think he's a great player. He, and, he um, is a great player. Have you played with him? Yeah. Never ever played with him. Wow! Look at that. So there's but, some firsts. So here we go at yeah, this event. About time. And have you rented out this room before for a gig? Uh, has he done? I uh, know. I mean, have you? Is this the first time you've rented out the Royal Albert Hall? Or do you do this every year? How often are you there? No, no, no. I, I mean, I've never done it myself. I, I've I, I've been on you know various bills at the Albert Hall. You know, over the years, starting at you know in the sixties. Um, you know, every decade I've done something at the Albert Hall, uh, which is a beautiful hall. It's a big, big round hall. Holds like five and a half thousand people. Yeah, no, and, it's uh, gorgeous. But it's surprisingly intimate. It's a very in- intimate room. That you, you've got the audience very close in front of you, which, which makes it feel very, very homey. And um, it, it's always fun, you know. Um, and and uh, the, the, they keep fixing the sounds to make it better and better. So. And what was your fun. first? You can. You were back there. You were there. You said in the '60s. Do you remember what what the occasion was to have played at that? Uh, I can't remember. It, it, it was. It was either some. I, I think it was some charity uh, concert. Um, for, for um, gosh, what was it for? Um, I, I forget. I, I think. To, I think to, to raise bail for somebody. No. Someone was in prison. <laughs> you know, on a, on a drug charge or something. <laughs> I think it was one of those, and, and so you know, we were on a mixed bill with with everybody on on the London underground scene at that time, you know, but possibly including the Pink Floyd. I don't, I, I can't remember exactly. Well, it's going to be exciting for you to have him there. And uh, as we wrap it up, there's another special venue for you each year, very different than the Royal Albert Hall, but it's your acoustic guitar and songwriting camp, Frets and Refrains, which takes place, it looks mm. like, in July, New York State. Explain what this is and how that got started for you. Well, um, it, it's a really beautiful uh, location. It's, it's up in the Catskill Mountains, uh, and it's it's uh, you know it's a resort there, like one of those old old um, Catskills uh, resorts. And um, they've been running music programs for a few years now. Um, uh, well, we, we've been doing our camp for I think for eight years. Uh, and uh, you know, you, you get people like Dewey and Zappa does a camp. You know, uh, um, uh, Steve Earle does a camp. Um, you know, there's various flavors of camp there, and and they just asked me if if, if I would do one, and um, uh, you know, I did it the first year, and I, and I kind of you know, you know stumbled through it um, <laughs> fairly successfully, I think, and uh, and um, you know, it sort of worked really well, and and we we've just kept doing it and, and honing it and refining it, and um, it's, it's just a wonderful camp. It, it's it's basically it's a guitar and songwriting camp. Um, so, so we have, you know, you know the, the best guitar instructors. We have the best songwriting teachers. Um, who have we had? We've had people like Sean Colvin teaching, uh, Paddy Griffin, um, my son Teddy Thompson, who, who's a, a, a wonderful songwriter. Um, well, we, we have a singing instructor as well. Um, you know, you know, various uh, acoustic guitar as well. It's, it's acoustic guitar camps, and, and well, we, we kind of emphasize. Um, a, a, a bit of UK flavour to it, so, so, so we, we tend to have sort of some, some kind of Celtic um, acoustic guitarists uh, teaching. Um, but it's you know it's great fun. We, we get 130 people every year, um, pretty much a sellout every year, and um, you know the weather's usually benign. Yeah, and uh, you know, even if it rains, it's it's still great. It's, it's still wonderful camp. Um, and it's a real short drive from Jersey, basically. <laughs> Yeah, you're just two hours from Jersey, so so that's that, that's convenient for me. Um, <laughs> if, if you come from Norway, it's not so convenient, but you know it's worth it. That's good stuff. And uh, final note: what you're doing at these shows? You got the band? Are you playing solo on these Hawaii dates? Give a little plug for yourself. Okay, I'm going to plug myself. This is with my band, uh, my trio, which um, so, uh, is basically a trio, but sometimes there's five people. Don't ask me. It's, it's very complicated. Um, so, so it's a five-piece trio. And uh, so it's electric, um, and, and I also do some acoustic numbers as well um, during the course of the evening, so, so it's kind of a mixture. Um, I'll be playing songs from uh, my entire catalog starting in the 60s, so... 70s, 80s, 90s, zeros, teens, uh, everything will be represented. Uh, we'll, we'll play a bunch of stuff off the last album, off of 13 Rivers. Uh, and uh, it should be great fun. And then you can tell a few stories about your birthday bash, we'll have, which, have just will, which will have just happened. 
Yeah, well, well I, I, hope, I hope the, the stories aren't too interesting. I, I hope that they're not about, you know, train wrecks and, and uh, you know, uh, mangled songs. Uh, I hope it's about a very successful evening. Let's hope so. Well, start brushing up on money or whatever you're going to play with Dave. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, I think yeah, I think we're doing uh, Fat Old Sun, actually. But. Oh, is, oh, wow, from the old psychedelic Fat Old Sun. Listen to you. <laughs> yeah. That's from back when they were doing the good stuff, green is the color, and all those real psycho echoes, the real psychedelic Floyd before the uh, yeah. before the depressing Floyd. Fat old son, wow! Listen to you. Yeah, That's... I did. Uh, I, I I did request money, but but uh, um, but, but, but that, that, that didn't go down. Um... <laughs> or another brick in the wall. That's what you should have done. Yeah, I think that's a bit too much of waters. I think. To what's the word? What did you say? It's a bit too Roger Waters. Right, right, exactly. Well, I don't know. Yeah. they seem to have come a little bit closer together. But, well, anyway, it's going to be fun for you and then fun for folks here who get to experience Richard Thompson returning to uh, the area. You're an OBE, but we don't have to call you sir, correct? I'm, I'm all right not calling uh, you sir? That's correct, yeah. No. Just double checking because some OBEs, you got to have the sir in there, right? Well, well that, that, that's, that's a high one. That's a KBE. Oh, okay. That's, uh, a KBE. That's, that's a different thing. Yeah, I, I'm not there. All right. Well, yeah, it's still impressive. Still, still had the queen <laughs> handed to you. Exactly. <laughs> I hope you had fun today. Yeah. This was great having you on. Ah, oh, it's, it's, it's a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Aloha, it's Richard Thompson. I bet you know why I'm back. That's right. We're having another pledge drive. And I bet you also remember hearing me on this show. I was a guest right here with my friend Dave Lawrence. Now I've returned, and I'm asking you for your money. <laughs> Not for Dave and I, but for HPR. We do have bills, you know. So come on with it, and we're grateful for your support. A successful celebration, young man. I hope that the thing goes uh, off without a hitch, and good luck playing with Big Dave. Uh, yeah, I hope so, too. I hope it's all going to be, be smooth. I'm sure it will be. I'm sure it'll be right. it'll be bollocks or whatever you, you would say over there in a nice English way. Uh, yeah, yeah. It'll be the dog's bollocks. <laughs> it'll be the, that would be that was a good thing, huh, if it's the dog's bollocks? It, 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 that's a very good thing, although it sounds disgusting, it's a very good thing. <laughs> well, up in Boston, where I worked for 12 years, if it was a good thing, it's Wicked Pissa. So I think Dog's Bollocks sounds better than Wicked Pissa. <laughs> it, it sounds equivalent, anyway. <laughs> exactly. God bless, Richard. Great talking to you, man. Oh, thanks so much. Thank you. Take care. Okay, all the best. Bye-bye. Bye.